I appreciate being invited to come and speak today on a subject that I care a lot about, which is targeted grazing and uh, managing our annual grasslands throughout rangelands in the West. So as Jim said, I'm April Hewlett. I'm the range extension specialist. I'm located in Boise and I have a statewide appointment. So I would love to come and meet you guys all if I haven't and many of you I have. And if um, I can be a resource, please don't hesitate to reach out. So I thought today in this presentation, I would talk a little bit about annual grasses and the ecology behind that, especially since that's what I'm trained in. Also talk about targeted grazing and put it in a context of how I handle situations when people come to my office and want to do this on their private land. So when we think about targeted grazing, we obviously have definitions. And I really like this one. It's from the Society for Range Management. And they say that targeted grazing is the carefully controlled grazing of livestock to accomplish specific vegetation management objectives. So I like to make sure everyone's on the same page when I talk about targeted grazing. So a lot of times uh, we, we obviously focus on vegetation and although we don't want cattle to necessarily lose weight, um, a gain is not usually our target. And so we wanna make sure that we understand what the goals are and objectives. And um, so that's where I wanna start, thinking about some of the management objectives and how I approach things when I get asked for help. So when we think about management objectives, I have five different questions I ask. And the first one is, where are you currently on the fence? Okay, hang on, because I don't know if I'm muted yet. Okay, oh. Are we good? Uh, like if I keep going? I really can't see anybody. So yeah. Okay, so where are we currently? And this is really important because when we think about rangelands, we have all different kind of landscapes. And this is just four that I want to talk about. So the first one up here, this number A, this is an area that has a lot of shrubs, it has a lot of grasses. A lot of people say that this is maybe one of the more healthy rangeland types. And then they vary. So B, we have low shrubs, but we still have quite a few grasses on the landscape. On C, we have um, not that many perennial grasses, but you can see we still have a lot of shrubs out there. And then D, this is usually after like a fire or something. We have low grasses, we have low perennial, or low perennial grasses and low fuels. And so all of these are gonna respond differently to any kind of treatment. Um, and specifically to targeted grazing. And all of them have different probabilities of transitioning to, to an undesired state. And maybe that's cheatgrass, maybe that's some other kind of weed, but either way, we really need to know where we are before we start any kind of project. So then we go through these other questions. Where do you wanna be? What is your goal as a, as a land manager? How do you get there? How will we know what and when um, adjustments need to be made? So we focus a lot on monitoring for that. And then how will you know if you're successful or not? So we clear up all those things and we start developing a plan. So I'm gonna to focus today on annual grasses, but I wanted to also supply some resources for everybody because I bet that you get approached by this using or with other species. So one of the resources that uh, you, I hope you're aware of is at least this targeted grazing website. I put the web address below. But this is a really good resource, especially if people have questions about, let's say like a forb or something like um, yellow star thistle. There's um, papers on that and they're all collected and so you can kind of get an idea of how to do it. But like I said, I'm gonna focus on annual grasses and when we think of annual grasses, the literature suggests that perennial bunch grasses are the key to preventing these exotic annuals from taking hold on the landscape. So most of my research focuses right around these perennial bunch grasses. How can we keep them on the landscape? And how can we make sure they're healthy on the landscape? So this is um, just a poster from the NRCS and it's showing different roots. And I really like this visual because sometimes we forget to think about what's happening in the soil. And specifically what's happening with our perennial bunch grasses and why we want them to stay on the landscape. So you can see in this red box, I mean, they are vigorous, right? They have these fibrous roots that are big and strong and they can, out, they can get a lot of resources, the water and the nutrients. This one right here is our invasive grass and this is cheatgrass specifically. And you can see, obviously cheatgrass isn't gonna invest a lot of energy in the roots because it's an annual, but you have to think, why is 
than perennial bunch grasses like blue bunch wheatgrass, for example, losing out to this little invasive weed. Here's another picture, and these are ones that have been dug out with a backhoe. So you can again see that fibrous root on that blue bunch wheatgrass, which is, sorry, I should have highlighted, which is this one right here. I mean, it's just this huge mass. So we think, well, we want to get, we want to keep our perennial bunch grasses, but how do we get there if we're already in an invaded annual state? And I want to talk a little bit about ecology, and I'm sure this is just a review, but it kind of gets everyone on the same page. So we think of these annuals, and cheatgrass and medusa head, for example, they're both winter annuals, which means that they're going to germinate early in the fall. And typically they get a head start on all of our other perennial grasses, right? They germinate in the fall, they produce some kind of leaf structure where they can get, where they can start photosynthesizing, and then they continue their cycle until they die in the spring. But these annual grasses are also bet hedgers. So they have the capability of also being spring annuals, right? So let's say conditions weren't right in the winter. Well, hey, I'm just gonna germinate in the spring. And so they germinate in the spring, they grow all summer, they seed, and then they die. Our perennial grasses, yeah, once established, they definitely have this really great cycle, but they're gonna germinate pretty slow in the spring, and that has to be considered when you're planning any kind of targeted grazing study. So this is one of my favorite graphs, and I know that it's, it looks like a headache to everyone, but there are so many good nuggets of knowledge in here. But I want you to focus on those three red bars. And this is indicating cheatgrass and how many days it takes for that seed to germinate on the landscape. So if you can imagine a seed of cheatgrass, in about six days, it's gonna be ready to grow. It's had enough uh, water, it's had enough nutrients that it can grow. These other ones, the yellow or crusted wheatgrass, the blue or blue bunch wheatgrass, the green squirrel tail, you can see that they take days longer. Cheat, or crusted wheatgrass is about 10 days to germinate on average. Blue bunch wheatgrass is closer to 11. Squirrel tail goes all the way up to 15 days. So that doesn't seem like a lot, maybe just on paper, but when you think about the ecological conditions of our range and what is actually happening out, out there, that five day spread is so critical for these plants. And so cheatgrass, it just beats everything out because it can germinate and get going so much quicker. So, also, when we think about annual grasses, not only do we have to consider those life cycles, but we also have to pay attention to fire, right? So we have a lot of fire in the West, um, maybe not the last few years, but we'll see this year what happens. But we know this invasive annual fire cycle just occurs. So you get more invasive annuals, you get more wildfire, and you get even more invasives and more wildfire, and this is a continuous loop. Nowadays, when we talk to people, it's not so much, well, if it's going to burn, you know, this might be some things you want to do, but really, what can you do when it burns? And just um, some newspaper article headings about some fire since 27 or 2007. And you can see this is all through the West, but we have these huge mega fires. And a lot of these start because, one, they're just cheatgrass and they dry out early, um, but then they're able to spread. And so this is kind of the baseline to any of our targeted grazing studies, especially with annual grasses, is we know it's going to fire or it's going to burn, but what can we do about that? Um, I just wanted to throw in this little bit of literature. Um, so we've had pretty easy wildfire seasons the last little bit, but there is a building evidence that uh, the large wildfires are or usually do occur about a year or two after average, um, above average plant production. So we are really set up, and I'm not trying to alarm anybody, but um, if you walked outside, you know that there's a lot of fuels on the ground. So with that, in annual grasses, we have the fires, we have their life cycle, all of these things working against us. And there's kind of two approaches with targeted grazing right now, especially here in Idaho. On one side, you have people that are really focused on fuel breaks. So fuel breaks are essentially pieces of land that are removed of vegetation. It's usually about 100 pounds per um, acre is what they shoot for, which is not a lot of plants. And I mean, the idea of that is to create this safe space so people can go in, the firefighters can go in and suppress the fire. And then the other side of that, you have people that are more looking at targeted grazing as a tool to restore a landscape, whether that's preemptively, so before a fire comes, 
or post um, fire, what's going to happen? So I'm not gonna talk a lot about fuel breaks unless I get um, some questions, then I can, but I wanted to include these resources and I uploaded the presentation to Box. So if you're interested, you can go on there. I think Jim sent the link out to everybody, but you can click on these and read more about the Paradigm Project, for example, that's um, a big multi-state project that's looking at fuel breaks. There's also some really neat videos on the Life of the Range um, website. So I just wanted to cut out there. The things that I guess I'm most interested in um, are using targeted grazing for more restoration purposes. So we have quite a few studies uh, evaluating different strategies to do this, and I thought I would highlight some of those. So the first study I wanted to highlight is a study that um, was conducted in Diamond, Oregon, so not too far from Boise. Um, and we burned this in September of 2014, and um, it was a study where we wanted to specifically look at grazing and its impact on fire. So is it going to change the size of wildfire? Is it going to change the intensity, the behavior? Um, so that would mean, is it gonna change the su suppression strategies of it, um, of, of wildfire? And so we really focused on an area that looked like A here. So we had good perennial bunch grasses, we had good shrub fuels, a lot of, um, it was very intact plant community. And we grazed these plots for five years prior to burning. And we used dormant grazing, so that means we grazed these areas from November through March. And, and so essentially what that did was to target different grasses. I mean, so I say that this was fairly intact, but we still had annuals, right? Because they're really hard to get rid of and we just manage for them. But we wanted to see. So overall, what's grazing going to do to a plant community like that? So we burned in September of 2014 and we got really interesting results. So area burned, for example. The grazed areas, which are the black bar, they um, obviously were less than the areas that were not grazed. So in grazed, we burned about 20% of the plots. And we burned five different plots. The ungrazed, we were closer to 60% of the land burned. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty exciting, right? If we don't burn as much, then we're gonna have more intact communities that then hopefully can reseed. And then we create this more mosaic pattern, which is traditionally what we had on the landscape. So that was um, an exciting result. We also looked at rate of spread. So this just means how fast is it going to move across the landscape? So again, the black is where we grazed and the gray bars are the ungrazed. So you can see our rate of spread is quite a bit slower in the grazed plots. This is really critical when we're thinking about su suppression strategies. Flame depth, you can picture that as the flame that's laying down on its side. How, how far is that across the landscape? So flame depth in our grazed plots was less than three feet. Areas that were ungrazed, it was closer to six feet. So you can imagine that spread jumping from plant to plant, it's quite a bit greater. greater. The flame height, this is a critical measurement and it determines whether you can attack a fire directly by hand or if you have to bring in specialized equipment or, or even aerial attack. So you can see with the, where we grazed, our flame heights was less than three feet. And where it was ungrazed, it was closer to 10. And that, that really changes how you can do it. One of the most exciting things, I guess, which is to me, which is pretty obvious to most people, but something I like to bring up when I'm talking to any kind of landowner is this idea of um, fuel moisture. And so that just means how much water or moisture is in the plant. So on that top photo, that's an ungrazed plant. You can see it's kind of wolfy is what we call it and there's dried materials and then the bottom one's been grazed. And so we wanted to see, hey, are these going to burn equally? And if they burn equally, when are they actually going to ignite? And so we started a study early July, as you can see on the bottom of this graph and it goes through September. And for each of these different plants, they lighted a mat and dropped it in and they wanted to see, does the plant ignite or not? So areas that were winter grazed or that dormant grazing, they're on the top bar, and then the ungrazed plots are on the bottom. Excuse me. So when we think about fuel moisture, anything that um, has more moisture than about 25% of its weight usually doesn't ignite. So that's kind of our threshold mark, which is that red bar. 
So you can see the areas that were not grazed that had that wolfy material, they were ready to ignite and spread early July. And that's not good for any of us, right? We don't want a long fire season and we definitely don't want fire injuring our perennial plants that maybe aren't quite dormant yet. So you can see July through September, ungrazed were ready to burn. Winter graze, July, they didn't catch fire. They didn't actually cross that threshold until August. So that's kind of moving it back to more of the normal um, fire regime that we like and that our plants are adapted to anyways. Another argument of why targeted grazing can be really useful on the landscape. So these studies kind of were um, a, a ground base for a few different studies that we have going on right now. So we have a fine fuel study going on in Malheur County, Oregon. And in this one, our management goal is, in, is pretty general. We want to improve Wyoming big sagebrush plant communities. So how are we going to do that? So the area is um, near Rockville, if you're familiar with that part of Oregon and Malheur County. And this is a big project. There's a lot of people involved in it. Um, it took a lot of effort just to get it approved where we could go out and do the grazing. And it started in 2017. So it's on the Three Fingers allotment, which is managed by the Vell District BLM. And in this area, there had been, and there is a lot of wildfires. And so in the red area, that's the Three Fingers allotment, it's about 130,000 acres. And within it, you can see these polygons. They're kind of shaded, but each of these represent different fires that have burned in the area. And there's close to 10 that have burned in the last 20 years. So obviously they're in that cheat grass or well, the annual grass fire cycle that just keeps continuing. If you cross the Idaho border, which is right here, all of this kind of grayish color or greenish, and that's the soda fire, if you guys re remember that, flipper right up to the Three Fingers allotment. So in this plant community, it's obviously experienced a lot of burns. And so we're facing more of this D kind of landscape. Right, we have some perennial grasses out there, but we definitely have a lot of annual grasses. <coughs> no, excuse me. So this is a picture from the landscape. And this is Medusa head. So Medusa head out there has definitely thriving. And I don't know if you guys have experienced Medusa head. Um, it is everywhere and it creates this really thick thatch on the landscape. And this thatch can be multiple inches and it carries fire so well, as you can imagine, right? There's the fuel continuity is, is really great out there. And not only that, but this annual grass, it will germinate in its thatch. So it has added benefits to its plant itself. So it will germinate in that thatch, but it prevents perennials or any kind of native plants from germinating it because one, the seeds have a hard time getting into the soil but also any resources like rain, sunlight, they're all limited in the situation. So we wanted to do a study out here and actually the ranchers are the ones who initiated the study, which is kind of great. They have great input and they have generously let us use their cows and will continue letting us use their cows. And so we wanted to look at this obviously from an experiment um, aspect. So we have areas that are no grazed. I know this is kind of full, but I just want to show you the treatment. So we have a no graze treatment where we have removed all grazing. We have traditional grazing. So the ranchers out there are still able to go out on that landscape and they go out in May and they usually stay through the end of August. We have a dormant season grazing so they can go out October 15th and they can stay till March 15th. And then we have an area that gets hit by both of those grazing timings. So this study is kind of interesting. So we started in 2017 and it's a 10 year study, but we've already had a lot of extreme weather situations out there, which makes our data even more fun to think about. Um, as you can see in 2019, which is expressed by that green bar, in February, which is a pretty critical month for our perennials as well as our annuals, we had over two inches of precipitation, followed by a late rain in May and April, and that we had three inches that month. And the average out here is, is about nine inches. So we had these huge fluctuations in precipitation. And so again, I'm just showing you this. So I'm gonna show you some results, but also express the need to do some long-term studies. So this is our study. And again, this is kind of a, a big graph, but here on the left, you're going to have the no grace treatment. 
And then we have all of our grazed treatments that follow. So annual grasses are expressed in blue. And this is Medusa head, and it's dominated by Medusa head out there. So between 2018 and 2019, we saw a big increase of our annual grasses. And that's not a huge surprise. I mean, we look at that, looking at that precipitation, we had over five inches during the spring, which is a critical time. We knew we were going to get an increase. But the exciting thing is to me at least is that even in our or where we had grazing, we still saw the increase, but it was a lot less than where we didn't have any grazing. And I think that shows the utility of grazing even under fluctuating climates. The litter, which is that thatch layer that I showed you earlier, that decreased in every plot. And that's expected too. I mean, right, the cattle are out there and they're actually are consuming some of the litter. But maybe even more importantly is when they're searching for other food, they're actually breaking up these big fat patches with their hooks. And so we're seeing a little bit more dispersion. Our perennial grasses and forbs, which are the red and the green, obviously we expected to see increases just due to precipitation and we did see that. There wasn't a difference between where we grazed and where we didn't graze, which is it's good news. At least we know that the cattle in this area aren't selecting for or injuring these plants. Um, we don't think they will anyways, but it's always good to have some data to confirm that. Um, the last study I want to share is a targeted grazing study, and this is one that we're just starting in the Caribou Targi National Forest. And we have Katie Lee, who's over in CALS, um, Karen Launchbaugh, Jim Sprinkles, and Eric Winford are all part of this grant. And this is a, another exciting one because it's kind of building off the research that we already have, except this time we're focused really on cheatgrass. This one's kind of fun because we have um, an environment that has all of these environmental conditions. So we have areas that have burned and that were rep repeatedly burned, but then we also have a lot of intact communities which look more like this A. So in these studies where, again, we're looking at fuels, especially fuel continuity, what can targeted grazing do for that? Because anytime we can reduce fuel continuity, hopefully we can decrease the size of wildfires. We're looking at perennial bunch grasses response. We want to make sure that we are maintaining them, if not increasing in these communities. Um, this one, we really are targeting uh, cheatgrass green up, and we want to understand more about that. So we'll instrument it with soil moisture sensors. And um, Jim, luckily we have him, he's gonna help us with some cattle, collaring some cattle, and also combining that with some re remote sensing work. And then we're really glad that Katie Lee's on board because she's going to be doing an economic component. So we say that targeted grazing benefits the ecology of the landscape, but does it have economic benefits as well? And if so, what are those? And if not, what are some, some of the things that we can work on to make that more doable? So I just wanted to give you one more resource, and this is um, the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange website. And it has a bunch of topics, but one of them is targeted grazing. And so it has, and it, we're continually building it, but it has pretty much all of the literature, the current literature on targeted grazing. So it's an easy resource to find literature if you're interested. You can search by topic once you get into the targeted grazing section but it is the most current um, place to get these resources. 